So today I'm going to talk about the, the Aru pajamas. And there's a bit of kind of preparatory comments. First of all, very basic, something to think about. Without, without a form, there wouldn't be any formless. And so if you lived in a world of no form, for example, how would you conceive of it? What would it be like? How would you know it was formless? Maybe it's a little bit like the, the paradox of the goldfish, having no idea there was anything else outside its underwater world. So it's implicit, actually, that there has to be a form counterpart to the formless somewhere as well as a formless counterpart to form. On a very practical level, this means that a meditator needs to have a good understanding of Rupa Jhana before tackling a Rupa Jhana. <coughs> if you think you're ready, then it could be very, very simple. Um, we've already talked about Rupa form level and to practice the Arupa could be could be actually as simple as this that's rather neat and then Bingo. All you've got to do is dissolve Rupa. If it was only as simple as that, we'll come back to what that really means in a minute. So again, kind of preparatory. Most of you are teachers. And the forms genres are one of those things where you've got to consider quite carefully before you attempt to teach it, whether it's the, the right time and the right person and circumstances to teach the formless jhanas. The main consideration is whether a person has a sufficiently strong sense of self, as well as enough experience of the rupa jhanas. It's not necessary to have fully, fully mastered them. In fact, I think a lot of you would uh, know from your own experience that when you started to explore the rupa jhanas, it had a really helpful effect on understanding Rupa Jhana. So it's one of those examples where you slightly take a step forward to clarify the previous step and the whole thing becomes, becomes interactive. Detaching from Rupa though, it means you let go <coughs> of all the anchors that we, we take for granted, living in a sensory world. Those anchors are mostly a reliable sense of where we are in time and space, um, a certain predictability of what we're going to experience one moment to the next. All those factors that we, we're so used to all our lives, which, which keep going our sense of I. And if a person is not ready, it can be very unsettling to let go of those too quickly and it can arouse fear. Even if you look at a, it's difficult now, but before the reform period in Thailand, in Burma, before the 1950s, if you went to a specialist meditation temple where the jhanas were taught, you would find that some meditators would practice and be quite satisfied with practicing maybe just the first Rupa Jhana, possibly the first and second. Then another group who would want to go further and understand all the four Rupa Jhanas would go further. Maybe not to full mastery, because mastery even in those times was something very rare. But then out of those group of people who practice all the Rupa Jhanas to some degree, not all of them, 
would necessarily want to practice the Aru pajamas. It wasn't a compulsory or expected stage. It was a, a kind of a little bit like a postgraduate degree. So if you wanted to, fine. But if you didn't, that was also fine. And the same thing applies in, in our tradition. There's no pressure or expectation that anyone in our tradition will master all the Rupa Jhanas, let alone practice their Rupa Jhanas. That's for yourself's teaching, to know what, um, you don't have an obligation to teach our Rupa Jhana. You certainly can't teach our Rupa Jhana to beginners. And then you also have to consider whether you yourself are sufficiently experienced to teach them. Um, which is really some, something to talk about with your teacher if you come to that point. And I know several people within um, Samatha who are teaching who I know quite well that they've chosen, even though they're practicing to some extent the Aruprajanas, they've chosen not to try to teach them yet. It just doesn't feel the right time. And even when they've had requests from members of their class to teach their Rupachanas, they've gently declined, acknowledging to themselves they don't feel quite ready, which is really very good, you know, to know your own limits. But when it is the right time, you usually you'll know. <coughs> In these talks, in the Rupa Jhanas, I've talked about the, the fine material realm of the Jhanas, which translates to becoming more aware of the kind of symbolic level of meaning or the metaphorical level of meaning. And the Yoga Vachara material is, this is central to the Yoga Vachara tradition. And within that tradition, there's a use of mantras and syllables which I think are actually very relevant to this transition to from the Rupa to the Arupa Jhanas. So just going back to um, the slide that we had, you probably know about some of this that when you put the letter A in front of a word in Pali it dissolves the meaning of the word. So this a ah, changes form to formless. And the same thing applies to um, anicca, anicca permanence, anicca impermanence, atta self, anatta non-self. And in the Yoga Vachara tradition, there's developed a, a kind of cult or great interest in the in the different syllables this is the Kom cambodian character for a ah. and it's, it comes up in many many mantra and sorry yantra and it's got an interesting characteristic that it's almost symmetrical so you can imagine dividing that so on the left is the original on the right, it's divided into two parts. The black is the left part, the red is the right part. And then if you took the mirror image of each of those two separated parts, so you've got the left part and its mirror image black, and the right part and its mirror image red. And then if you merge them, superimpose them, excuse <coughs> me, you come to a point where they cancel each other out. And disappear. So the A has got this characteristic of actually being able to negate itself. Or so the tradition goes in the in this particular niche area of the yoga vachara. So the top there is the character A, and I want to just mention a few 
examples of this kind of area in the yoga vichara. The, the group below occurs a lot in the yoga vichara, ma'a o. These are the cone characters, ma, a, again, and u. U is rather like the symbol you see above uh, the Buddha head, um, Theos Nisa rising up, only it's the inverse of this. It's pointing upwards, ma, a, u. One of the most common places where you come across ma, a, u in yoga vachara is in yantra, particularly yantra which had to do with the body what they call Om Pra Yantra. Ma stands for the basis of the whole practice, the lineage, everything that has led you there, the earth, and also the mother. Ma, you know, Ma is a very interesting syllable. It's very, very close to all the different ways a baby calls for its mother. Mama, or Mare, in Thai it's Mare. In French to mer. So ma is particularly the mother that gives birth to this whole possibility. A is in the middle part, although actually technically it's at the junction between the central part and the head. A It's the shortest vowel that we have. We sound it at the back of the throat. Ah. The property it has in the yoga vachara is it's got the property to cut. It can cut and negate the meaning of a word. If you, if you split it and invert the parts, it can negate itself. And in the meditation tradition, it stands for change of lineage, gotrabu. The point where something is cut between transferring from sensory consciousness into jhana consciousness or from the mundane world into the super mundane path. So, ah, also interestingly, in, the, um, in a neuroscience view, it stands at the transition point in jhana consciousness between the brain activities and the body activities. So the back of the throat where you sound it is just below the brain stem where that transition region is. So ma, a, then u arises. U is realization. Oh, in Pali, if you put it in front of a word, gives the sense of upwards or higher, which is appropriate to this. Something from the foundation to some development, the body waking up, a transition point, and then realization. Other examples are Buddha, which we've talked about before is a very familiar way of recollecting the Buddha and the Buddhist path and it's also the core of the Bhutto meditation one of the oldest ways of practicing and developing jhana Bhut on the in-breath Do on the out-breath and those are the two characters Bhut, Do Metta again is very very common in the yoga vachara, as it is in chanting, we chant the metta sutta before most of our practices. And again, if you want to arouse the feeling of metta in meditation, usually you would intone me on the in breath, and ta on the out breath, me ta, and those are the Cambodian characters. Arahang is also very important in the yoga vachara. <clears throat> Again, it's a way of recollecting the Buddha and enlightenment and realization, but it's different to Bhutto and Metta in one very, very important way. Bhutto, in breath, out breath. Metta, in breath, out breath. At Rahang, you've got a possibility 
of not just a linear motion in Buddha and Meta, but a circular motion, Abraham. And one of the ways that's used in yoga vichara practices is for healing. So Abraham intoned with the breathing in and out can be done in such a way linked to the nimitta to make the nimitta spin to give it a circular motion and this the central syllable ra which is this is a cambodian character it's got that quality of rolling you know like rolling your arms ra so when you intone this in meditation linked to for example the nimitta it's not difficult to set the nimitta spinning either clockwise, arahang, grounded clockwise. With the intention that as it spins, it spins away any cloudiness, any disorder, any illness in the body or in any part of the body. Nakmo Bhutaya is also well known as a recollection of the Buddha. It, it comes up in many, many yantra. Uh, including many of the old tattoos that um, monks used to wear. And then the I put in the other ones here because one of the interesting things about this use of syllables, which I find absolutely fascinating, particularly for a person who finds it very difficult to recollect suttas or chants, of which I'm one of those, if you invoke, if you intone, it it be so, and you've heard the it it be so chant many, many times, it's sufficient it it be so to evoke the whole sense of the whole chant. The same thing with um, Karaniya Atakusalena for the Metta Sutta. There's something about those first few words, the first few syllables, that once you've heard the Metta Sutta and understood a little about its meaning, just evoking, just intoning those words to oneself, Karani and Atta Kusalena, evokes the whole thing. If you want to go to the limit, Ewan Me Sutan, which occurs at the beginning of all the suttas that Ananda recalled after the Buddha's death, thus have I heard, Ewan Me Sutan. You don't have to read all the suttas. A one may sit down. If you're really lazy meditating, it's maybe maybe good enough. It's good enough for me. So is they they're very helpful to loosen the, the assumptions we have, you know, about a kind of rigidity of meaning in language which we take for granted, we kind of assume that language clearly conveys meaning. But it only conveys part of the meaning because once you choose a word, you've limited the whole range of possibilities. Another word is excluded. So the use of this kind of very fluid way of looking at syllables and yantra is helpful to kind of let go of those characteristics of sensory consciousness and not to depend too much on, on them. And particularly when you're approaching something like the Aru Pajanas, that, that's not bad, it's quite helpful. So now let's talk about the, the Aru Pajanas. So why, what happens to lead someone to practice Aru Pajana? The fourth Aru Pajana we talked about last time is the perfection of jhana, of the rupa jhanas. You could almost view the rupa jhanas as developing simply jhana without any distinction necessarily between one, two, three, and four. It's just developing jhana to an ever more deeper and perfect completion, which is the fourth rupa jhana. But the fourth rupa jhana, once you get some familiarity with it and you come to the end of the practice and emerge you may realize at some point that it's actually still limited you've got there by developing a limiter 
And even though in the in the full throughput channel, when it's well developed, you're not attending to the emitter as an object. It's just part of the absorption. Everything has come together. So you're not aware of, a, of an object, but nevertheless, when you emerge from the fall through pajana, at some point you will recognize that it's still um, a held state. It's the best term I've used, I've come across to describe it. It's a held state. It may be not clear what it is that holds it, but something is holding it together. And you also realize that it depends on the whole development from the letting go of sensory consciousness through the developing attention to learning something about attachment to feeling. So even in that very, very subtle fall through pajana, you realize in the emerging, in reflecting on it, that it still is held. And then in a very, very subtle way, there's a thread right back into the sensory consciousness world, Rupa. It's a world of Rupa. So, at some point, a meditator might wish to let go of that dependence, to transcend it. And whether that happens for a meditator depends very much on where a person is in their kind of sense of self. Because to develop the formless jhanas, it's really a process of developing insight into the self and effectively dismantling our assumptions of who we are. The assumptions of we're a subject in different situations where there are many different objects. So the Arupajanas are um, ways of unpicking all the assumptions we have, particularly subject-object, rupa-arupa relationships, and eventually perception itself. Right to the threshold in the third and fourth arupa jhanas, to the threshold of perception, and ultimately, what does consciousness really mean? So, The terms for the Arupa Jhanas consciousness is Vinyana, Vinyana and Jayatana. The Ayatana is the um, the word for a sphere or a realm, Ayatana. Akasa is the Pali word for space and vinyana the word for consciousness so remember when i talk about those words later that's where that's the, the original pali talk developing the first and then second Arupa Jhana is because <coughs> although I said for the Rupa Jhanas that you can't think yourselves into them, the Arupa Jhanas are so strange, you know, the whole concept, what does infinity or boundlessness mean? So strange that most meditators have to at least make a start by trying to conceptualize what that means to some degree. Otherwise, it's very difficult to find a starting point. And one or two meditators, quite a few actually, have found when they're practicing outside, certainly at Green Street, the National Center, you may be practicing the Rupa Jhanas. You may have some intention of wanting to develop the Arupa Jhanas, and you open your eyes and you gaze at the sky. And sometimes in the in summer, the sky may be almost free of clouds. So this, this is kind of an example of that. Just one, one solitary cloud. And it's an interesting exercise for a meditator to look at that after practicing Rupa Jhana and 
imagine what it would be feel like, what, what the experience would be like if the sky became totally cloudless, no features to distinguish, nothing to compare cloud here or not. And when you do, when you follow that exercise, that thought exercise, you realize that actually, even if it became cloudless, then there's still the problem that the, um, there's still the problem that there's a horizon and there are, you know, bits of the garden in your peripheral vision. And so it is far from boundless. There are still possible objects. But it's a starting point. So, if a meditator then closes the eyes back into meditation, if you're trying to develop the first Anurupa jhana, probably using the longest length of breath, then you can have the intention of letting go of any discrimination, any comparison of one bit, one bit of the sky or the field of experience to another. All limits, letting go of all limits. The reason the longest length is helpful, at least to begin with, is that as you breathe in a long breath, you can have the intention of letting go of limits. You know, breathing in a long breath, something expands until there's no limit whatsoever. Later on, it's not necessary to worry about the length of the breath, but to begin with, it can be quite helpful. And then, traditionally, as a kind of final stage of letting go of limits, in the Yoga Vichara, it's recommended that the meditator uses the syllables for space, or later for the second Arupajana consciousness, use the, use the words as ways of invoking the experience. So for the first Arupajana, the meditator takes the word Akasa, or if you prefer the English word space, and use it as an invocation. And also behind this somewhere is knowing that space is not empty. The, the word um, Akasa derives from the root Kas which implies radiance, actually. But it's not the kind of radiance that is an object like light or a, a discrete emitter. It's a kind of um, radiance, more in the sense of a, of a kind of a life potential. So when you use the syllable akasa, you intone quietly to yourself, once or twice or three times, Akasa, Akasa. And at the end of the word, the final A, Akasa, you have the intention that as that end comes, it creates a space into which the invocation is that you experience the first Anurupajana, infinite space. Akasa, let it become manifest effectively. Okasa, if you remember in the Yoga Vachara, is this magical word. Okasa, let it become manifest. So in the evoking of the first Anurupajana, Akasa, you come to the end of it, let it be manifest is implicit. And you may find yourself becoming part of infinite space. And when I say becoming part of it, you have to sometimes, to begin with, play with this. But what you find is that you start to get a feel of what it means to let go of limits and boundaries. And to do that, you find, quite naturally, this is not a thinking exercise, 
you find that you have to actually go into space, become space. For it to become unlimited, boundless, infinite, the only way is if you become it. This is a really fascinating experience. Very clever technique, because it allows the meditator, once you get a feel of this, to identify with the object position, completely unaware of being a subject. Just infinite space, nothing else. Actually, also, to fit there is a subtle feeling of freedom in this, freedom from boundaries, from limits. But anyway, that's the realm of infinite space. Now, the second Arupa jhana, how does that fit in to that first one? Because they're very interrelated. how to move, how to develop the second Arupachana, which is infinite consciousness, which is the counterpart to the first. Because if the object which you're experiencing is infinite, somewhere there has to be in the background, behind you, or somewhere, there has to be an infinite consciousness or a boundless consciousness to, to hold that experience. But in infinite space, you're totally unaware of it. But yet, you know, it has to be there somewhere. And there was a lovely book written back in the 60s, late 60s, by, it was called, some of you may know of it, it's not very well known now, called The Foundations of Tibetan Mysticism by Lama Govinda, Anagarika Govinda. And he wrote, extremely relevant to this, even though he's talking from a Tibetan tradition. He knew quite a lot about the um, Theravada tradition. He wrote that in the moment in which a being becomes conscious of his consciousness, he becomes conscious of space. And in the moment in which he becomes conscious of the infinity of space, he realizes the infinity of consciousness. which is a very profound statement actually, because it conveys the way they're interrelated. Which is only something which can be understood by starting to explore the Arupa Jhanas. You know, the whole, the whole technique of the idea of a, a, a no limit, boundaryless experience, infinite experience is a fascinating technique which allows the meditator to separate the subject object poles. Of course they're still both there and counterpart but the experiences of complete identification with either the object pole in the infinite space first in Rupajana or the subject pole of consciousness in the second Arupa Jhana. Very clever technique, you know. How did that, how did someone think that? Well, I guess it was the, the Buddha or someone before the Buddha, but very clever. So, I think that is enough chat and we'll practice for a little while. For about half an hour. And this time I will make a great effort to remember to sound the bell. First of all, at the beginning, I'd like to ask you to practice as well as you can the Rupa Jhana. Don't worry too much about the distinctions. 
if you've been listening to these talks, develop attention, move to the nimitta, the touching, the settling, and allow yourself to just deepen and deepen the stillness towards the, as deep as you can go, to the fourth of pajana. Doesn't matter if it's perfect. And then I'll sound the bell for a second time, and I'd like you to um, move towards the longest length of breath again, breathe in, and develop the first Arupachana, infinite space. If you want to reflect first on what I mentioned about the sky and limits, okay, and then move to use the syllable Akasa. And then the next bell will like you to move to the Arupa jhana of infinite consciousness, which what happens is from the moment where you're practicing infinite space and your experiences of just infinite space, you hear the bell. When you hear the bell, which interferes, interrupts your stream of consciousness, at that moment simply advert to the consciousness of infinite space. It's like stepping back into your subjectivity and con continue the quality of limitless, limitless consciousness. It's rather like standing at the mind door, you know, and you're looking out and there's nothing to discriminate in infinite space. And there's also, at the same time, when you advert back to the subject for infinite potential to be conscious of anything, if you took an object. But if you don't take an object, it's simply limitless consciousness. consciousness. So I have to keep this in my mind. Four bells, one to start, one to change to the first arrow pujana, the third to change to the second arrow pujana, and the fourth to finish practice. Then as usual, when you come out, stay with the stillness, and we come back together. If anyone wants to comment on anything, feel free to do so. And as usual, no need for anyone to respond until someone else comments, and then someone else, and then at some point, um, we might have a more interactive discussion. So finish practice, but remain in the stillness for a while before returning to thinking. Whether it's relevant, um, it will be. <clears throat> But yeah, I had a, like, a quite a strange experience where I was working my way through the stages and it just felt like a real heavy downward energy in, in my stomach. And I was struggling with the shortest breath, so I went to the longest breath. Um, and I just had a weird desire to like spell my body of all its air. So I was could only do a short in-breath, but then I was really the longest breath was really prolonged and I just had the desire to just sit there with like an empty, <laughs> I just like held it for a while. It just felt very natural. I'd never done that before. Um, I think it might be in your reference to like letting go. Um, but it felt, um, and it helped. It just helped with what was going on in my body at the time. 
So yeah, that was my observation. <laughs> okay. Space and felt it merges with the consciousness. Uh, they all merge into one. I felt the consciousness forming the basis for the infinite space as well. Both merged. It's just the consciousness is left in the end. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that is the infinite consciousness or it was the consciousness. Mm -hmm. Did it happen for you before I sounded the bell to move to the consciousness, infinite consciousness? Did it happen naturally for you? Naturally, yes. It was there at the basis of uh, while I am in the spacious. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. The first week of the journey, it, it almost felt like flying, really, <laughs> even though there wasn't any sky. Um, <laughs> um, uh, that it had that kind of feeling almost of motion, although there wasn't any. And then the second had a quality that felt almost watery. Um, There's like a kind of smoothness to it. And um, I suppose a bit like, maybe like a lake that has no ripples, but more three-dimensional. So that, that was interesting. Peter? Yeah, a phrase I came across in the Tibetan, big sky mind, which seems to kind of, a nice triggering phrase perhaps. And um, it's really, I mean, I'm still in that kind of, in that kind of, it's hard for me to come into form. <laughs> I think that's what I'm trying to say. Um, but I did catch, because normally I'm somebody who's, who's sort of like, you know, I'm spending, the, you know, spent best part of my life trying to come into form and so I'm still at the PT stage so it was quite interesting to to actually with a group and with the intention to go a bit further mm -hmm. and I found myself I could catch myself that place of oh this is scary I don't know if I can let go of into this mm -hmm. sense of spaciousness it was a sort of like, I could feel that, that, oh, no, no, no. I could feel the grip wanting to hold on to something. Mm. And it sort of kind of felt like, oh, because it resonates. It has a sort of similar feeling to a place that, that I experience um, of, especially in the mornings of waking up and feeling quite lost and... Um, not quite in form and that that's a lostness a sense of real mm -hmm. lostness and that can be so to move into that sense of spaciousness it's got that similar flavor to it so it's sort of like it was just catching catching that and just allowing something else to move in it was sort of like it's really quite bizarre because it's kind of like a ball of sunlight appeared and then I saw these men dancing like from a Hollywood <laughs> movie. God knows what that means, but these men that it was kind of joyful, these men dancing um like uh like singing in the rain from the film Singing in the Rain, something like that. That's got that joy in front of the the sun. So that was that was just just to get that glimmer. It was really nice actually.
Mm. So thank you to the whole group for <laughs> holding that intention. So it's lovely. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, that, that it's very helpful to feel part of a group doing the same kind of thing. But what you described, the reason I'm just jumping in, is you're describing um, something quite well about how you may feel you're not quite ready to go to practice the Arupa Jhanas. And actually, if you, if you don't rush it, you know, it can be really helpful to clarify the, the Rupa basis. And, you know, you're talk, you mentioned the, the stage of the second Rupa Jhana, PT, embodiment. And then later on, you get that image coming up of joyfulness and uh, the energy in that and dancing. And you're, in a way, getting a sense of the, of the, of the two, touching on a, a, a little bit of the sense of letting go into the Arupa, but also the other is still very nearby. But very good that you can get that taste without feeling frightened, you know, and the group is very helpful to do it in a group. Very, very helpful. Um, and you'll find when you practice if you very careful in your own practice, you'll still be able to touch on it. But certainly when we have the opportunity to practice in a group again, you know, even online too, but also face to face, then it will, it will just become um, clearer and clearer. Thank you very much. Normally when I practice, I, I, I stay very embodied, but now I noticed like in coming out of the practice that I really had to kind of take my time to kind of reconstitute this embodiment or kind of, yeah, I don't know. It really took, it really took, took a bit, yeah, just a bit longer to kind of get back into mm. this embodiment kind of feeling. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, that's a similar experience to what Pauline was just talking about. That helpful awareness, comparison between the two modes, Rupa and Arupa, they depend on each other in a really interesting way. And it's very helpful when you get more experience to actually move not just between the Rupa Jhanas, the first to the second, the first to the third, or the fourth to the second, and to get really familiar with the feel of each one. But many meditators have commented to me how helpful it's been when you get more familiar with what you're talking about, to be able to recognize the same thing that you just said, that, that you can feel the process of reconnecting to, to the Rupa world, to your body. And you can feel the process of and not be afraid of it, but being less connected, in other words, freer. Sarah mentioned the kind of feeling that, that you had, and you were trying to put words on it about the flying and so forth. But looking at you as you were talking about it, the quality that, uh, that I will pick up in that is feeling more free, you know, a bird is a very good example. What's it feel like to be free to fly, you know, weightless like that? So the, the quality of the Arupa jhanas when you come back to the stillness, which is subtly different to the Rupa jhanas, is, is the freedom of boundaries, freedom of limitation. practice Paul um, about the fourth Rupa Jhana um, that you know the realization comes that is actually a hell a hell state <laughs> I just found that very stark and uh, it's still with me and resonating you know um, sorry did you understand me to say hell or hell hell hell, hell. I suppose I mean I've, I've heard H -E -L -L. it H-E double L yeah, that, that's what I heard. <laughs> did, you realize, did you realize later that I meant H-E-L-D? 
no, no, it, it was, <laughs> that's what I heard, which is interesting because I have that sense that the, in the fourth Rupa Jhana, you know, there, there comes, if there's a progression with the Jhanas that, you know, each leads to the next um, and that there's a sense of dissatisfaction Okay. Wherever there is in each one that leads to regression to the next. Okay. And you, you, you did very helpfully say that it, it wasn't necessary to perfect anything <laughs> and no. to work with yeah. or to play with the, yeah. Yeah. with these states. It's really, really interesting when yeah. someone yeah. feels something in a totally different way. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And... It, it kind of highlights something as well that the um, some people do describe the progression through the jhanas as looking at each one and recognizing something as dissatisfying. I don't think that is actually a good a good way of describing them, and um, I suspect quite a lot of that comes from a kind of um, austerity tradition. Whereas once, once the second Rupa Jhana is reasonably familiar and the body starts to really relax and you feel the body can let go of a lot of tension, you free up the ability to just rest in good feeling. And that's never lost in the rest of the progression. And sometimes if you feel that there's a dissatisfaction creeping in, and it depends partly on temperament, um, there are some temperaments who there's something in the Abhidhamma which describes um, the kind of residual attachments or cravings craving for becoming and craving for annihilation it goes back to kind of very subtle psychological um, patterns that we experience in life so someone who tends towards um, uh, the kind of emptiness or direction is subtly different to a person who tends towards uh, wanting more and more happiness different kinds of craving which eventually become um, not, a, not both come together in the end but so if you find that in the later jhanas, there's a sense of dissatisfaction creeping in. It's quite helpful to go back to the earlier stage, the, the, certainly the second rupa jhana, to really familiarize yourself with the satisfaction and contentment and allow yourself to fully experience it, not to resist it. Um, I know this from not just my experience, but several other people who've got a tendency to drop into emptiness. <coughs> Having to make a real effort to value the, um, the happiness, the happiness of the Rupa Jhanas. So the two are very interesting in counterpoint. And when you move between the two, as you just, just trying to describe, it highlights this. And it can help you then recognize that, you know, it's a real value to developing happiness in the Rupa Jhanas. Um, because only if you, if you can arouse it and experience it, is it able to be let go of in the fourth Rupa Jhana. Um, in the same way that without experience suffering, difficult to understand what happiness is. Um, it's quite delicate and this is why it's so important to be careful about the introducing it to people in your class if you're a teacher but also for yourself when um, when Naibuman started to more openly teach the Arupajanas of course he touched on them at various points to some extent from the beginning, but not so openly as he did from about night, from about um, probably about 2008. 
uh, he had to be really prevailed upon to actively teach the Arab pajamas. I guess that was to do with him working out whether he felt it was the right um, time and etc. Particularly given that he was only coming here once a year. And looking back, I think quite a number of meditators would recognize that they found it quite difficult, in a, in a way of sort of aversion to practicing the Aruba jhanas, a touch of fear. That's no longer the case. There's a lot more understanding of the Aruba jhanas. There's enough experience to, to help each other with them. But not to put pressure on anyone or yourself to, to hasten, you know, to try and push it too hard. It needs a very, you have to be kind to yourself. And it's important to be able to go back to Rupajana and um, enjoy the happiness in it before moving into um, the formless. And then, as we're talking about next time, the third era of Pajana is emptiness. And so he needs a, he needs a, a delicate touch of patience. And behind the scenes, a lot of people have found it very helpful to, from time to time, practice the Brahma Viharas. You know, kindness to yourself and to others, compassion, sharing in happiness of others. If you see someone happy, be happy for them and then feel it in yourself and then equanimity that basically we're all in the same boat. So it needs that kind of container too, not just a container from the Sangha, from the group, but also to balance, to be able to balance all the faculties because when you're living an ordinary life, um, it becomes really important to hold your balance. So, Hi. Oh, do you want me to say something? <laughs> <laughs> Up to you. Up to you. Mm. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, I am practicing Arupa um, from time to time, and then particularly with uh, Nai Buman's course. And, uh, Yes, today I had the amazing, well, from my point of view, it was an amazing experience. Um, I felt a really deep sense of peace. And, uh, yeah, I felt really happy, mm -hmm. satisfied, really deep satisfied. I just felt yeah, deep sense of happiness mm. Mm. and the peace. Yeah. And it's a uh, physical that you showed us that yantra is almost like that. My body became so um, erected and uh, it's not the normal kind of posture. Just my body became so kind of rigidly up and then wanted just to open up the kind of chest and then it's uh, elate, really top. And then it's a front was really kind of open space, but the body was integrated. Mm. And uh, consciousness was uh, hardly probably there. Mm. And uh, then gradually I felt so peaceful, very, very deep peaceful. I never experienced like that before. So yeah. thank you, everybody. Yeah. Mm. And that kind of uh, happiness is very interesting. Some people who actually found it quite difficult to fully develop happiness in the Rupa jhanas, in a sort of paradoxical way, find it 
quite freeing in the Arrow pajamas, and I may be a little bit surprised that real happiness can arise. Exactly as you're describing, but also you're stressing the deep, deep peacefulness. And when you come out of a practice like that and you to stay with the stillness and experience that deep peacefulness, you realize also that it's got a deep quality of freedom. Freedom from suffering, which is subtly different to the held state, H-E-L-D, of the Rupa jhanas. Free of that, no need to be held anymore. And you're right also when you, you know, yourself and someone else is saying in a way, thank you to the group, because you realize that this is very, very helpful and very important that other people in their own ways, subtly different to, to you, to each other, are working with the same things. And somehow it all comes together in, in, in helping each person to go that little bit further even online like this, it's really quite remarkable. Something I, was, I, I didn't fully expect, you know, um, giving talks online or practicing online in this way. Very, Very still, um, so still, in fact, that coming back took quite some time and uh, needed some care. Mm. But the uh, I find that in being in that place of um, infiniteness, infinite infinite sort of presence mm. that finding um, how to say a, a thread the wish the pleasantness the deep the depth of that um, is very has a kind of magnetic quality <laughs> and and that um, it isn't it is as if staying there is in some ways, many ways preferable to coming back. And so to find the way, mm. the link um, needed really quite some care today, which was very interesting. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, that actually showed something about how entering works as well. Yeah. So that the act of finding the link to more, actually to different kind of, of feeling and different kind of presence in the body, but making links through that um, and seeing a kind of reluctance to do that to begin with, uh, but finding how to do it, very, very interesting, mm. very Mm. very stirring in a way is it coming back is it coming back to different qualities of the body and feeling yeah very interesting yeah and again this is why it's so helpful practicing both rupa and arupa jhana um, what you're describing is that it allows you to recognize um, the kind of depth that's possible and then through the comparison to needing to come back to the realm of you know, form, um, it, it highlights the depth you've been. And what's really interesting about that is that many meditators uh, practicing in the early stages of Rupa Jhana, or even right through to the fourth Rupa Jhana, um, don't 
always recognised just how deep the absorption can go. Mm. So many of us, and this is partly because we're a lay organisation, there's, there's this background um, understanding that we're going to have to come out and deal with everyday life. And so we touch on jhana, we get a bit more familiar with it, we go a little deeper, we're able to keep it going without distraction, without just reverting to sensory consciousness or dropping into deep sleep. But it's, it's actually quite rare that a person fully develops each of the jhanas to the depth that each is possible. Full absorption, which is rather like you're describing, even the first rupa jhana can come to a point where it becomes sufficiently deep and absorbed that there may also be that urge to stay there, like the kind of magnetic bit you're talking about, where everything really comes together, that often meditators don't fully realize just how deep they can go. And that's fine, actually, because particularly when you're leading a, a, a lay life, you have to, um, it's quite a complicated process. But when you move to the Arupa Jhanas, it's so different in letting go of boundaries that it can make it clear. And then it's really, really helpful when you're going through the whole process again from the first to the second or third, particularly if you've got time. If you're on a retreat where there's, there's a lot of time to allow yourself to fully experience each one. And it doesn't necessarily mean sitting for one or two hours. It's more to do with completely trusting that you can go deeply into absorption without fear that you're going to be able to come out. And you set the resolution, and once you've done it a few times, you realize that going in and the resolution to stay and coming out become more familiar and then it's all normalized in that sense. Before um, I might sign off. A very wide range of comments, you know, they really illustrate how everyone has different insights, uh, which are so, so helpful to everyone, including me, to hear those. They help you articulate things which you may not otherwise uh, think about or be able to articulate. So thank you, next time we talk about the third and fourth hour pajamas. Okay, thank you, goodbye. Bye-bye.